what that means for our production is that this production we've been working on a month now. I mean, it's an extremely, it's a very costly production of Don Giovanni and it's very, very physical, um, very specialized work. And they're really, and it, it being Vienna and Don Giovanni, Mozart, their um, Bogdan, the, uh, the intendant here is very, very, Dedic uh, uh, he's um, determined to make it work. So as it stands, he has already made a deal. Like the day that we found out about the lockdown, he had already made a deal by 1230 in the afternoon with Austrian National Television Network to have our opening live stream. So it'll be live streamed on Austrian National Television and it'll also be streamed worldwide on um, the Wiener Staatsoper's uh, uh, streaming yeah. service. And that is the 5th of December. On the Dallas Opera Network, you're listening to Opera Box Score. Uh, let's get ready to rumble! Wherever you are, however you're listening, it is America's Talk Radio Show about opera. It's Opera Box Score. I'm your host, George Cedarquist, joined by Oliver Camacho and Weston Williams. All right, this week, we go inside the huddle with Kyle Kettleson. The heartthrob American-based baritone is currently in Austria, and we wanted to ask him what's going on with the lockdown and why are they still rehearsing? But his conversation with the Oliver ended up covering so much more. Plus, two-minute drill. Look, friends of the OBS are achieving major accomplishments, like getting Grammy nominations and winning the Marian Anderson Vocal Award. If you want to take the next step in your career, better get in touch. Yeah, we're talking to you, Yannick. <laughs> if you're on TDO with us, you want to make sure you subscribe to the podcast on Stitcher. You can even just favorite the show on Apple Podcasts. And of course, make sure you email us your hot takes, operaboxscore at gmail.com. You drop us a line. You get an OBS beer coaster and an OBS lapel pin. Man, that's a lot of swag. Oliver Camacho <laughs> repping the lapel pin right there. It's been there the whole time, folks. It's like one of those <laughs> subtle advertisements for this call to action. We've been pro prepping you for a year to hear about George's new scheme to get you to engage with us. It's been there all along, baby. And if you play our episode backwards, you can hear us talking about Satan, too. It's pretty great. <laughs> That's Weston Williams. There he is. Yeah, I, here I am. I don't have my button on me at the moment. It's uh, attached to my laptop bag currently. But one of these days, I'm going to write in to uh, opera box score at gmail .com yeah, and get another one. Yeah. <laughs> Weston's got the roll tied hound. You'll have to flags. disguise your name. You have to be like Weston Billiams or something. <laughs> <laughs> Easton uh, uh, Wontz, Wontums. Is Wont Look. the opposite of Will? Yes, it is. Y'all know that I'm a huge diehard Michigan Wolverines fan. You may mm -hmm. also know that Michigan plays its final game of the regular season every year against the hated Ohio State Buckeyes. Uh, Michigan <laughs> has not won this game in 10 years. But last Saturday, the Saturday after Thanksgiving, finally a 42-27 victory over the Buckeyes. If you're watching on TDO, you can see right here, baby, you got maize and blue right here. You got Michi Michigan. Wait, wait, what's says, what's under? What does it say under Michigan, George? Oh, it, it's Michigan yeah, uh, Gilbert and Sullivan Society. <laughs> um. Nerd. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk some opera. Huddle up. Let's go inside the huddle. Sorry, everybody. I'm eating chips because I had one of those days where it's been nonstop, and the only thing I can put in my mouth is something crunchy and loud, perfect for a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it really let it wash over yeah. you. Um, so over the Thanksgiving weekend, I was able to get in touch with Kyle Kettleson, and he was super generous with his time. We actually have such a long interview, I had to edit some of it out. Um, one of the things that got edited was one of the main reasons why I wanted to talk to him, uh, which is what's going on in Austria. So at the top of the show, you heard a little bit of, of that conversation. But in short, uh, they are a month into rehearsing the brand new Barry Kosky production of Don Giovanni at Wiener Staatsoper. And the intendant, Bogdan Roscic, seems to be... Uh, in negotiations with Alexander Schallenberg, the Chancellor of Austria, so that 
uh, the lockdown will end <laughs> in time for um, the run of Don Giovanni. Now that is called to... clout. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> they're going to miss um, the first three performances that are scheduled, but the first scheduled performance was going to be the live stream, which is actually going to happen just without an audience. Mm. So that happens, I think, on December 5th and will be streamed on the Wiener Staatsoper streaming platform. So we can see it. And uh, in this production, Kyle Kettleson, who is a renowned Leporello, has been singing Leporello like his whole life, is going Does to Does he have singing. that on his LinkedIn profile? Right now, <laughs> <Leporello>. <laughs> uh, he will be singing the role of Don Giovanni. But I wanted to talk to him about Leporello, and we begin the conversation, I think, talking about Leporello, where we are going to edit into it. Uh, I remember his Leporello from 2014, which he did here in Chicago in the Robert Falls production at Lyric Opera, which starred Ana Maria Martinez and Marina Rebecca and Marius Kvitschen. Man, was he so good in that show. And it was one of those performances where I felt like, oh, I am seeing a complete artist. Like, this guy is so embodied in the role. He really has the physical thing timed out so well where it just feels so natural. Like, he's responding to what's happening on stage. You know, sometimes you go see a show and somebody could drop, like, one of their costume parts and it's on the ground and like nobody touches it because it's like not in their blocking to like touch it like that would never happen with Kyle oh, Kettleson. Yes. Kyle Kettleson's type person like sees everything that's happening on stage and like just knows how to do everything in character and to time everything he just looks so fantastic and he sounds like a million bucks uh, so I wanted to talk to him about singing Leporello but we ended up surprisingly talking about Building a family as an opera singer, which is one of our favorite topics. And also a surprise topic I wasn't expecting, how to deal with acid reflux. <laughs> we actually <laughs> talked about it for like 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, so we're going to get into this interview right now. Warning, it was early for me um, when we recorded this. So I'm very puffy. So this is how I normally look in real life. But in the morning, I'm just... <laughs> it's why it's a podcast, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Yeah, I've sung Leporello like it's literally like 170 performances, 180 performances of Leporello. I've done maybe 30 productions, 35 productions. I can't, I've lost track, um, but it's right around there. And, you know, for years, I didn't want to approach Giovanni. Um, I had too much uh, respect for the role to think that I could do it any anywhere nearly as well as I it should be done. Um. I first sang Giovanni at grad school in English, at Indiana University in English in 1997, I think. And it was very difficult. Um, and then I didn't touch it for another nine years. And that's that was in Minnesota Opera in 2006. And it was off the heels, on the heels of uh, the greatest vocal crisis of my career, which was mm. caused by a reflux. It was before I had acid reflux under control and my voice basically disappeared. I lost my resonance, I lost my range. And then I was asked to do, not asked, but I was already contracted to do John Giovanni just a few months after I had this huge, huge event in my vocal life, so to speak. And so I sang that thing horribly. I didn't, I couldn't cover anything. I couldn't, I couldn't soften any of the high mm. notes. Um, I had to ask the conductor to take uh, one of the arias down a half step so I could sing it. It was very, very difficult. And then, um, you know, I've just loved the character of Leporello so much. You have the yeah. tool by Da Ponte and Mozart to steal the show every night if you can do it. And so I had quite a good success with that role. And, you know, it's funny because um, so 06 was the last time I had, I've done it. So we're talking 15, almost 16 years because it was January of 06. So almost 16 years. Um, and a couple things happened during that time. One, I did a Leporello in Tokyo and it was in concert version. And I remember thinking after the show, and this is probably four years ago, wow, I, I, I sang, I sang that, I felt great about that vocally. Why, what was different about tonight? And then I of course realized, well, I'm not rolling around on the floor and doing somersaults and being beaten <laughs> in the sextet and running around. You know, I could actually just stand and deliver. And then it kind of flipped the switch in my head. Maybe Giovanni might be something that I could do. And, and I've always, I, I've fielded offers 
from companies asking me to do Giovanni and my agent has always brought it up to me. And I just kind of say, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Um, Cause I've, you know, I've worked with, uh, you know, Terville and Keenly side and Finley and, you know, all these guys as the Giovanni. Um, and I've seen what they've done. And I, and I've often thought I can't do that well enough to my, for my um, satisfaction. But so there, a couple things happened that Tokyo gig was like the, uh, the a switch had been flipped. And also, you know, the, my voice type, which is true bass baritone, a bass with high notes, the, my voice has changed. I'm 50 now. And so um, you suddenly things are a whole lot easier to sing right now than they were. And I'm, it's kind of opened my eyes to doing much heavier repertoire and then over over COVID, there were a couple of things that were that I did um, the, my first Kaspa and Freischutz in Munich, which is heavy. And then I had people coming out of the woodwork saying, "What Wagnerian do you do? What you know? What do you?" I said, "Nothing, nothing. I don't do." So now I'm kind of opening my eyes to that. Maybe a Dutchman, or maybe a Rheingold. Um, um, Mima. No, what's his name? The one-eyed man. <laughs> Votan, there you go. That'd be the only Votan that I could probably do oh, right okay, now. The, okay, interesting. Um, but wait, you you touched on so many things right now, and I yeah, I, right. I wind it back. Um, it's the it's the Lagavulin that, yeah. that caused it. It's because I I always try to make this show um, about things that people can really relate to and see themselves in somebody who's had a successful career as you. You had reflux. Um, what were the symptoms? what was it like to not know and what was the um you know the therapy so you know i think back to well before i i had the blowout i had the the first time i remember it being a it, it affecting my singing and i didn't know it was reflux was when i was singing a high note and it would so on a high note instead of going ah it would, go, ah, ah, it would just break up a little bit mm -hmm. And I thought, what is, why is it doing that? That was reflux. Um, so the chords were not meeting all the way because there were some, they weren't clean. They weren't all the probably way. Inf the inflamed, them, or probably or irritated, like inflamed. That. You know, when you have um, uh, one of the strongest acids known to man wash over your chords and your pharynx and your larynx, mm -hmm. ain't that great for mm -hmm. singing. Whereas most people, you know, non-singers, doesn't bother them a bit if they have a little yeah. bit of rasp to their voice that has character, right? Yeah. But for us, you know, elite users of this thing, these two flaps of skin down here, we notice every little bit. And so that was like the canary in the coal mine for me. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, I took some, some proton pump inhibitors, you know, your Nexium, Prilus, like that sort of thing in a, in a, a lesser um, dose at first. And then I remember from, from basketball, because I played basketball, I had to stop 10 years ago, but I, I played for 21 years, just, you know, passionately um, at school, then at another school, and then you know, into, like, whenever, wherever I would travel, I would find a basketball court there, and that was my, that was my um, exercise, and I tore ACL over here on my right side, and then I tore the ACL on my left side, and then I tore the ACL on my right side, well, the second ACL surgery I had, I gave myself enough time or as much time after the surgery as I did my first ACL surgery to start singing again. And I started singing. And basically this is 2005, December of 2005 is when I had the second ACL. And I started singing because I had a gig coming up and I wanted to start preparing again. I was up and walking and, and um, I, my voice, it hit a ceiling. I would, uh, and it would stop. Uh, and, it, and it was like, I didn't, I couldn't go through my passaggio and I couldn't go into the, um, my head voice. I couldn't cover anything. And it felt exactly like it felt, or it reminded me of very much of when I was 19 and had just started studying singing and didn't know how to do that stuff. Yeah. The difference was I know how to do it, but suddenly my voice, my body wasn't letting me, the, the ability was not there. And so you know, I just start wondering what's going on. And so I ended up seeing a, a, a great um, speech therapist named Brian Petty at University of Wisconsin Hospitals uh, in Madison. 
who's great, great, great. And he, I then saw Dr. Ford, who was a legend at University of Wisconsin. And so between the two of them, we kind of, you know, I, I did daily, um, for 18 months, I did daily exercises. And it took that long to get my voice back to feeling like it was anything. And I had, I had role debuts during that time. I mean, and house debuts. I did Figaro at Covent Garden during that time. I did Escamillo and Sem and, um, in uh, San Francisco at that time. And I didn't do them justice at all. You know, I didn't cancel anything for better or worse during that period. So anyway, you know, it, it's a, it's a period of life. And the more singers I speak to, the more have that experience, not exactly that experience, but they have an experience where they came to a, uh, a crisis in their vocal life. And they thought, what else can I do? What is there? Can I, you know, if if I can't be a singer, because you know singers are crazy. No matter, I mean, I consider myself a pretty sane singer, but there's still that little crazy corner of my brain that talks to me. You know, like you'll never sing again. You'll never, you know, you're screwed. Even even if you want to have a cold, mm -hmm. you know, there's a little voice that says you're never gonna sing again, and you and you try and tamp it down and say shut up, that's nuts. <laughs> and most of the time, it's wrong. Well, this, you know, it was pretty, it was pretty um, desperate. And so uh, it was a, it was a down time for me, you know, mentally. And I'm not a depressive type at all, but I was, oof, that was tough, but it, it just, I clawed back out of it. Good call, bad call on Opera Box Score. Oh my goodness. This is what happens when, when Cummings and Hardgrave aren't here is we end up talking about TikTok or maybe, <laughs> maybe we do more if they, if they we're a good call, bad call. I'm going to wrap up the show. Start with Oliver Camacho. I'm not sure exactly what day this article came out, um, but I read it on Thanksgiving morning as I was, uh, you know, doing my morning uh, TikTok scroll looking for that cowboy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is an article called The Miraculous Sound of Forgiveness, which was written by Matthew O'Coin and uh, written for The Atlantic, which happens to coincide with his opera being produced at the Met, which will be uh, broadcast in HD um, next, by the time you hear this, this coming Saturday. And he has a book coming out. I'm not sure if it's already been, it's come out, but it's it's all really well-timed. So congratulations, Matthew O'Coin, for, or your PR people, for making all these things happen simultaneously. But anyway, the article I'm talking about is called, um, oh, what's the name of this article? Um, the Miraculous Sound of Forgiveness. So go ahead and put The Miraculous Sound of Forgiveness into your search engine or The Atlantic and Matthew O'Coin. It is the description, a description of the forgiveness scene in the conclusion of The Marriage of Figaro. And that always like makes the waterworks happen for me. Like whenever I see it, if I see it in the college production, it's just like pff, crying. Uh, but he describes it and tries to analyze why we cry when we hear this music. And he does an amazing job of analyzing it. And I could not help but hear those passages through his description and thus triggering the waterworks. So if you need a good cry and you're a Figaro stan like I am, go ahead and look for this article. Very nice. Weston Williams. Well, uh, the Iron Bowl happened last week, so um, if you'll excuse me, I have to step away from the microphone because this is going to be very loud. Uh, pardon me for just just a second. Oh, God, what is Roll this? Roll Tide! <laughs> it's just so phenomenally irritating. You're so masculine, Weston. And I, and I really like Weston. Oh, good, he didn't hear me. I think he blew out his microphone on that. Hey, I, my good call is opera related for once this week. I have a very good friend from London staying who um, hopped out of, he's staying in our apartment. He hopped out of bed one morning wearing very tight, long underwear on his bottom half and very tight turtleneck, long underwear on his top half. So Turtleneck, like, long underwear? Turtleneck, long underwear. And he started prancing around saying like, I'm ready to be in a Philip Glass opera. <laughs> Happy Hanukkah I that. <laughs> to all our listeners as well. That is it for this week's edition of America's Talk radio show about opera. Our announcer, Norm Waddell. He's at normwaddell.com. On Facebook, search for Opera Box Score. On Twitter and Instagram, we're at Opera Box Score. And please help us deepen that bench of listeners. Like and share 
our social media posts. Email us your hot takes, upperboxscore at gmail.com. Drop us a line. Get some OBS merch just for sharing your own hot take. Again, subscribe to the podcast on Stitcher. Favorite the show on Apple Podcasts. Hit up the website, upperboxscore.com, for links for the show. Our creative consultant is Oliver Camacho. Our audio and video editor is Weston Williams. For your co-hosts, Matt Cummings and Ashley Hargrave, what the heck? We'll give them a shout out to. I'm George Cedarquist asking you to continue the conversation about operas. You put the hurt on the Ohio State Buckeyes in your own way. We're back with an all-new show next week when we lay our wreaths at the grave of Stephen Sondheim. Plus, you get more opera headlines, more hot takes, and more creative uses for turkey. The meat. Join us 